Before I hand over to uh, to Brother Colin, who will be moderating this session, um, I would like just to say a few words of welcome. We have with us uh, this morning the Superior General of the Society of Mary, Father John Larson. John, you are very welcome. difficult or at least ambiguous moments when Father Colin presided at the at General Chapter of 1853 and okay. Father Faber presided in 1862 and there were some differences of opinion about whether they should be there or how they should be there. John, can I assure you that there is no difference of opinion over your very, you are very welcome among us this morning. <laughs> Um, we also have uh, some other Maris with us. Um, Father Ben McKenna is a member of the General Council of the Maris Fathers. Very welcome, Ben. Father Frank Bird is, uh, is currently studying at, uh, from New Zealand, is currently studying here in Rome. We're very welcome, Frank. Um, Father um, Fastino is, uh, is from Russia, with um, the is uh, a, a scholar in the society. Uh, you're very welcome, brother. Also, um, and uh, we will have. We had a, another Mara sister join us yesterday. Sister Sylvia, she's be back tomorrow, and uh, Sister Mary will be with us this afternoon. So it's it's wonderful to uh, to have this the, the full breadth of our Mara's family with us, and uh, particularly this morning as we uh, as we. Uh, are led by uh, Father Alois Raila. So I hand over to Colin, who will introduce uh, Alois. Thank you. It's with great pleasure, and I must admit, with a great sense of relief, that I'm able to introduce Father Raila, who um, always has battled through snow and ice and all sorts of winter conditions from Bavaria down to Rome. It's, it's great that he can be here with us. Um, the man of many parts, many talents. Currently, he's a school chaplain, teacher of religion, a spiritual director in a major seminary, and uh, a leading light in Mars studies within the Society of Mary. He was ordained in 1988, and has, since his ordination, been involved in parish work, youth work, teaching, different forms of chaplaincy work in, in Mars schools, and in what he refers to as Marist ethos work. He has a doctorate in church history from the University of Louvain in Belgium, and his doctoral thesis, I believe, was his decree on his priestly formation of the Second Vatican Council. Um, he's, the results of his research over the years into Marist history, Marist spirituality, have been disseminated in the form of retreats, conferences, many, many publications. And he specialized in the life and spirituality of Jean-Claude Collin, and the Marist missions in the Pacific, and the history of the German province of the Society of Mary. I first met Alois in the year 2008 when he came to the Marist patrimony course we were running here at the at the General House and he talked to us about the Society of May and took us to the Society General House to show us the archives. It was a wonderful experience to have him. So I'm absolutely delighted that he has managed to be here with us. Um, he says that at the end of his talk he'll be happy to the questions provided they're in German. <laughs> but I, I think he, he might be, appear to be a bit lax on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brother Colin. We now move to Father Colin. <laughs> and then it says, why beatify Colin? It's not him. <laughs> why not? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but he's already next to the postulator. <laughs> that could help. Good morning, very welcome. I try to speak in English, not my native language. And here you see the topic. 
and I could and I will begin by asking you who would be in favor of beatifying Father Jean-Claude Collin? Thank you. I'll ask you again at the end of the talk. Let us imagine a conversation among Marists from the different branches about Marist saints. If you ask a Marist brother, easy. Marcella Champagne, canonized 1999. And many other names. If you ask a Marist sister, like Kate here, she might say, our foundress is not a saint, but an inspiration for us nevertheless. And some of the sisters may add, for the patience she had with Kola, she should be canonized. <laughs> the SMSM face the challenge of a whole group of women at their origin, the pioneers. Though it is not unknown for the church, to beatify groups of people, like the seven founders of the Servites. Lay Marists could proudly claim the Curie of Arras and Peter Julia Emar, and depending on their alliance, also Champagne or Chanel. If you ask the Marist fathers, now oh, that's difficult, oh, here. <laughs> Is your founder a saint? They will either say, he is not, and that is not important, or they will say, he is not, but we hope he will be. Others will say, canonized or not, for me personally, he is a saint and my inspiration. Others again will say, our Marist saint is Peter Chanel. For example, I'm a school chaplain. If you ask in the Marist school where I work, who is the Marist founder, they will all say Peter Chanel. <laughs> because we have great devotion and festivity for Chanel, but not for Kula. And Marist fathers from the Northern Hemisphere tend to say, canonize Kola. Too expensive. <laughs> In this presentation, I will raise, I will raise the question on a higher level because it's not only a question for the Marists among themselves, whether or not to beatify Kola, it's a question the Pope is free to decide after a certain canonical process. The real question is not what the Marists think, but what the Church thinks. The Church asked us recently, why should Jean-Claude Collin be beatified? And this is the question I try to discuss. One, Marist causes, a brief overview. The cause of Father Koller is embedded in the broader question of Marist causes. I limit myself to a few names and an important conclusion. Koller said that the society will have martyrs, will have saints. In April 1842, he heard about the death of Chanel. And immediately, he set to work to launch the canonical process of beatification. His wish was to place busts of Chanel Epal in the Marist houses. When Brother Blaise was killed, he said, now all three groups of members have their saint. The priests Chanel, the bishops Epal, and the brothers Blaise.
Color, important point for me, is a figure in a school of saints. Some canonized and others regarded as saintly. His companions, Chanel, Champagne, Emma, are canonized. And so is his friend and admirer, Jean-Baptiste Marie Vianney, the Curie of Arles. The process of beatification was opened for Brother Blaise Montmorton and Father Paul Marie Ducharme. And for the many heroic missionaries in the Pacific, with and after Chanel, we could list Bishop Duar as a candidate. And then there is Jean Marie Jawa as Marie Francoise Berton, a school of saints around Colin. And if we move on to the next generations, we have Father Emmett McHardy from Chile. Ah, candidate for possible beatification. In the German Materiologium, we have Marist Wilhelm Weber, beheaded in Bougainville in May 1945. In our Spanish Materiologium, we name the Marists killed during the Marist fathers killed during the Civil War in the 1930s in Spain. And there are many more who Marists and others may regard as saintly. Conclusion can only be and I count it as one reason for beatification. Kola is an inspiration behind a school of saints, of course to a varying degree, but still, he was part of their story and he called them to holiness, a holiness he himself tried to live. When to the cause of Father Kola, <laughs> that's a funny one. Kola himself started the process of beatification, of beatification for Peter Schandel. So another tick on our list in favor of beatification, Kola was aware of this instrument of the church and supported it. Looking more closely at the cause of Kola, the story is complex and characterized by delays. The society basically had started the cause for Chanel and a little later for Colin. At some point the decision was made, we go ahead with Chanel, Martha, easier, Colin has to wait. And successfully so, 1954, here Chanel was canonized a saint and proto-martyr of Oceania. So the cause of Kola was delayed because of Chanel. Then came World War One. Then came World War Two. And then came the historical objections by the Vatican against the cause. And then the main obstacle against the beatification of Kola, the Maris Fathers. <laughs> The society at some point supported the cause, other stages no. Support, no interest. Support, no support. The cause was introduced in 1839. The initial stage led to the title Venerable in 1908. By 1941 the official procedures had practically stopped. Because of the long break, the cause had to start all over again, and this happened in 2009. But let me say, for beatification, a number of basic elements are achieved. We have his writings, his virtues are recognized, we have the historical documentation, we discussed objections, we have an official biography. 
We have the conservation of the grave, that is the protection of the relics. The society is working on the pharma. The question of a miracle is still open. So when you think of it, what does a, an event beyond scientific knowledge really <laughs> tell us about holiness and faith and the exemplary nature of the life of the church. But it shows you how the scientific world also influences church life. Three, the historical objections against the beatification of Colan. His writings were approved in 1907, in 1908 he was declared venerable. After 1908 the cause was challenged by objections, reasons not to beatify Colan. Those were summed up in a study by the church historian Lituria from the Gregoriana in Rome. In the 1950s, Fathers Kost and Lazar, whom some of you may know or have read things, Kost and Lazar were called to the General House to prepare a response to the historical objections and did so according, important, the criteria at the time, you know very well these criteria by the Vatican <coughs> keep changing. There were four main obstacles. Did Kola falsify a signature? Why did he delay to write his constitutions? His relationship, Brother Michael mentioned it, with his successor Favre and the relationship between Kola and the bishops in Oceania. And Kost studied those, and I think he came up with uh, substantial answers. Since then, we could name more historical objections. For example, Kola and Chavois. Tragedy, real difficulty, what happened there? Cola and Champagne, there are still issues out there which need to be clarified. Then, between 1855 and 1860, Cola practically withdrew from the Society of Mary. No interest, silence. Then, he even thought about joining starting and joining a new congregation, the Eucharistic branch of the Society of Mary. So there are new historical objections. Personally, I think also the writings should be critically edited and then studied again. I'm sure the edition of 1907 is not up to the standards of today. Now, all these historical objections, I believe, we can study, discuss, and find a reasonable answer. An even bigger, more puzzling obstacle to the beatification is the resistance of many Marist fathers to have him beatified. And why is this? Some answer, Kola himself said, Oh no, I do not want to be beatified or canonized. Well, Kost, since long time, has shown that this saying is apocryphal. Never said this. And it's not up to him either. Beatification is up to the church. However, 
Yes, there is a deeper issue at stake. Does not the hidden and unknown feature of Mahayana spirituality exclude him from being raised to the facade of St. Peter's in Rome? We will come back to this. And another argument is money. Too expensive. Well, go to the Mahayana brothers. <laughs> and it may be that we do not have enough money. But it should not be an excuse to discuss the importance of our founder, a possible beatification. Let us therefore look at the meaning of beatification as a path to answer our overall question. The meaning of beatification. In the Catholic Church, beatification and canonization, the role of saints in liturgy and faith life, are important. Fundamental opposition to it would require a completely different discussion. The liturgical celebration of a beatification is the final result of a canonical process directed by the Holy See. Veneration, privately or liturgically, after beatification, is focused on the local church or, in our case, a religious family. Conditions, martyrdom, <coughs> virtues lived in a heroic way, a miracle at the intercession of the person. And the person died in the Fama Sanctitatis, believed to be a saint, or gave his life out of charity and service. Con conditions. Well, the condition heroic virtues is approved for Colan. Since 1908, he's called Venerabilis Dei Servus, Venerable. Beatification implies we believe the person has reached fulfillment in God we can pray to him and with him at his intercession. The person has a message for the church as a whole. Important argument. In the case of Kola, we can say the following. He himself was strong in his belief in saints and their intercession. He wanted the Marists to be saints. He was not a martyr. He did not die in the order of sanctity. We have yet no miracle. The canonical process had been started under the conditions of the early 20th century and is now reopened, but under the much stricter conditions of the early 21st century. People, very important, normally, people do not beatify themselves. Beatification is not done for a private person, purpose. And it's not done to do the Marist fathers a favor. The subject, the actor, the agent is the church. If the church sees meaning in a positive decision, then it goes ahead for the sake of the whole church. The question of beatification is the problem, and I think in the problem is the solution. If Kola has a message for the church, beatification is what is asked for. Fifth point, significant shift to the positive. Our postulator, your colleague, Carlo Maria Schianchi, had communications from the Vatican about the next steps in the course. For the Positio, a short presentation of the cause, the Marists are asked to present two things. A biographical, biographical note of about six to ten pages and a paper of about four to five pages 
why the church should beatify Kola. Now, Society of Mary, tell us, why the church should beatify Kola? Now, Justin Taylor is working on the biographical note. He wrote to me, I wrote a biography of a thousand pages. I wrote a short life of a hundred pages. I think I'm qualified to write one about ten pages. <laughs> and my presentation possibly could serve the second topic, why the church should beatify Kola. Here I see a very important new angle. If you notice, until now, it was all the time what is against the beatification, the arguments against the beatification, so negative approach. Now it is a positive approach. What would be the value of a beatified kola for the whole church? What does speak in his favor? And again, it's not what the person wants. It's not what the Marists, the Marist fathers want or do not want. It is what the church says. Let me courtroom. Let me call the witnesses. Witnesses in favor of beatification. In an anecdotal way, so only a few glimpses into history, the first witness is Kola himself, against the widespread idea of him being against beatification, he himself promoted beatification and inspired people who were beatified. He had a great devotion for saints, the first aim of the Society of Mary, according to his constitutions was personal holiness. When in Rome, Kola had many dealings with Cardinal Castracane. He said about Kola around 1833-1834, quote, Cardinal Castracane spoke about him, raising him very highly to Mr. Crociani and to Mr. Duclos. Kola, he is one of those men you rarely see anymore. He is the via simplex et rectus spoken about in Holy Scripture. Mr. Collin, no, the Monsieur in French, I guess. Monsieur Collin is a saint. He has understood the age in which he lives. End of quote. Third witness, Father Pupinel. Early on, some people regarded Kola as a saint, as an anecdote written by, down by Father Pupinel tells us, quote, People were often impressed with his look of holiness and simplicity, by his modesty and humility. One, a certain canon ferry, clearly expected that he would be canonized one day, and that his statue would occupy the then vacant niche in St. Peter's beside that of Alfonso's Liguori. End of quote. If you know St. Peter's inside the different founders and saints, there was one niche empty. This will be for Kola. And what really happened was outside this is Champagne. <laughs> but it reflects Kola was regarded by many is a saintly person. Colin called Jean-Marie Vianney, his friend, a saint. And Vianney, the curie of Arles, called him a saint. My fifth and main witness at this point is the eminent Marist historian Jean Coste, died in 1994. Called to assist the cause of Father Founder in the 1950s, he gave up a career as an exegete to work on the life and writings and work of Colin. In fact, Cost changed the self-understanding of the society in many ways and is still the point of reference for research today. 
As an answer to our question, let me refer to something Kost has written. Quote, 1988. If ever Kola gets to be beatified and canonized, I hope this is what they will put in Bernini's glory. Kola, whose holiness consisted in understanding his era and not in turning away from it. Kola, who saw the means to touch it, to heal it, to convert it, he did not turn his back on his era. But he tried to imagine a kind of presence, unknown and hidden, which enables us to be there as close as possible at the very core of what is in the hearts of people. End of quote. If you listen carefully, you will recognize Kost makes reference to Cardinal Castelcane and says, Kola, his approach would be an immense treasure in our pastoral ministry today. Again in 1990, Kost talked about the topic, quote, this society which you, Kola, passionately loved, we intend to bring alive. For this we will be helped by that profound vision which encouraged you that of Mary, support of the Church at the beginning and at the end of time. Quote, end of quote. Final quote by Kost, shortly before his death. I do not know whether the Church will ever pronounce on his sanctity, but I am convinced that few men in his time served God better than he. And I do think that whatever happens, I shall keep that profound conviction to my dying day. Now, if someone like Kost, who for 50 years, day and night, studied Kola, probably knew Kola better than Kola knew himself, <laughs> comes to this conclusion, I think he's a very good witness. I summarize the next point, the farmer of Kola, to work on, make him known. Ask the Mars fathers, first reaction, response will be, do not know what to say, Kola, saint or not. But in a conversation, you will discover, and we have studied this in a questionnaire, asking many Mars fathers, in a conversation, they will say at the end, yes, when I think of it, he is my inspiration. <laughs> Wouldn't be aware of it immediately, but the more I think of it, yes, he is my inspiration. <coughs> and that's typical. You can go through many books and look at many lives, and at some point you will discover an inspiration behind a person, a saint, a saintly person, a founder, a work, a ministry, a mission in the Pacific. An inspiration behind was Colin, Jean-Claude Colin. A very paradoxical impression under which Kola was and is often perceived. Kola is the inspiration for others, the man in the background, and what I call the paradox of grace. Eight, on a deeper level, society of Mary, 
or Society of Cologne. Bernard Lee once discussed the model of deep story as a tool to reflect on the charisma of an institution. The constant paradox we come across, Cola, a saint, yes or no, may echo an underlying deeper issue in the case of our founder, focus on Cola or focus on Mary. Many congregations are named after the person who founded them, Benedictines, Franciscans, Augustinians. The Maris Fathers do not call themselves Society of Colan, or colonialists, or colonists, <laughs> but Society of Mary. The Marist historiography is a different paradigm changes at the beginning, to be a Marist was all about Mary, the Marian. Marian virtues, Marian humility, personal holiness, education, and Oceania. Since Vatican II, it's all about a Marian church. So maybe the Marists, in their resistance, sense this challenge of a society of Mary or a society of Colin. Colin himself was always pointing towards Mary as the true inspiration and our model. There's no need to beatify Mary. <laughs> In fact, our foundress is mentioned every time during Mass. It always strikes me as, as good in saying Mass. So, Society of Mary or Society of Colin? Again, the problem contains the answer. While many call the long 19th century the age of Mary, and in this, Kola holds a prominent place. The Catholic Church, since the middle of the 20th century, has somewhat lost this importance Mary used to have. And a side effect, of course, affects the a congregation like our congregation. To beatify Kola would bring back Mary into the Church. And I think this is worth it and a very important point. And so let me try a more systematic answer. Kola, for a Marist vision of the Church, after raising the issue, after looking at the present status of the cause, let us turn to a more systematic approach. Why beatify Kola? A. The criteria of the beatification process. It fulfills many of the criteria. A miracle is the big question. B, criteria from the virtue model. According to this model, to beatify Kola would be to have a, Mary, a saint, a model for Marian humility. C, criteria from a mystical model. The major shift in modern theology is towards experience hidden and unknown as it were in this world, points to the kenosis of Christ, and in many ways, in our modern era, it seems God himself or herself is, as it were, hidden and unknown in their Colinian understanding and approach could help us. D, criteria from the founderology model, the founderology, the study of the specific nature and theology of founding persons. I would say, clearly, Jean-Claude Collin was given a specific race. 
called by God for a specific mission, spirituality, expressed in constitutions, not constitutions copied from others, but written by himself, inspiration for a religious family and many saintly people. So, we believe that Kola received a call from God to make a contribution to the mission of the Church. And the main point for his beatification would be from a, a Mariological model or model of grace. Looking at Kola, we return to the central place Mary holds, not only for personal holiness, virtues and personal humility and uh, spirituality of service, not only for the individual. But the big difference Kola makes is to say, this is not only for personal piety, this is an inspiration for the whole church as a body. The whole church should be humble. The whole church should be a church serving people. The whole church should be listening to God first of all. The whole church should respect the developments of today. The whole church should make herself available to God's call and work as Mary did. The whole church should be so simple and humble and admit its weaknesses so that God can use the Church as an instrument of mercy, an instrument of God's grace for the sake of people. And that can only be done with a person and an institution, not putting itself forward, but being humble and of service and understanding itself as an instrument, as Mary did. Through people like Mary, God can do great things. And Kola would bring us back to this point, not only the individual, but the church as a whole. And so a main reason for me to beatify him is Kola's vision of the church, church with an eye for the needs of the people, a church inspired by the example of Mary, with Marists playing her role of support for the church today. Church global and a church local. There's hope if I find my last page. Conclusion. The light of the overall topic of this Marist Symposium sources and streams. I say the founder should certainly be a source promoted by beatification. God has given him a specific vocation and grace and charisma. This may hopefully overflow in each member of the congregation today for the good of the church and the people of God. For the Society of Mary in general, beatification was and is accepted by Kola himself and ever since. In his constitutions, Kola placed personal holiness as one of the aims of the society. He had a devotion for saints and wanted Chanel beatified, who was in favor of this instrument. The cause of Father Kola went through a long process delayed for various reasons, but all along even if the result is not achieved. It achieved so much in terms of Marist studies, better understanding of our history and our spirituality. Some steps in the process for beatification have already been achieved. Other ways we are still struggling. Key question is the miracle. The main thing is the shift to the positive to answer the question of the Church, why should we beatify Kola? Not to do you a favor, but give us a reason. 
I propose to start from the meaning of beatification rather than from the opinions among Marists. Beatification, decision of the church for the good of the whole church. What difference would it make to beatify him? For all who feel inspired by Kola, it would make a personal difference if the founder is beatified. It promotes Marist research. His beatification would highlight the charism of all Marist branches because Kolam played a role in the stories of the many other Marists. To beatify Kolam would have a historical and geographical relevance for religious life, for the church in the Pacific, for all the places where Marists live and work. Because this charism, I believe, is still relevant today, a Marist vision of the Church, his teaching of the hidden and unknown in this world, Mary in support of the Church and at the beginning, at the end, at the same time unobtrusive and full of zeal. And all this not only for the individual person and piety, but for the institution. Kola, spiritual inspiration for many. Beatify Kola would bring back Mary into the life of the Church and the Christians. A Marian saint who saw in the attitude of Mary, hidden and yet full of zeal, the inspiration for the Church as a whole, the Church Marian, instrument of God's grace, understanding the needs of the time. And I believe that is what we need today. Thank you. Alois, thank you for your presentation. I find myself in agreement with a great deal of what we've said, especially about Father Crowland looking at the church as an instrument of mercy and that kind of making mercy a central plank of evangelization in the early 19th century, I think is still relevant today and a lot of writings I agree with. But I find myself, there's a stumbling block for me in this treatment of Jaimini Shavwan and you mentioned that but you haven't addressed it and I'm sure you've given the thought. There's an aspect of the beatification of anyone that has to be about today, not just the past. So for example, I remember in 1999, someone asking the question, do we really need the canonization of another French 19th century priest who founded a religious order called Martha Champagne? It was a good question, because there has to be something about today. And when I look at what the synodal process is doing, about the place of women in the church, I wonder how we engage with that, and I say we as a modest, with given that, and it wasn't a minor incident, his relationship with Jamie Shavon, how do we engage with that both historically and what message it would give today? Thank you, yes to the point, and yes, Kola Shavua is a problem which needs to be studied more, there are studies done, but it needs to be studied more, absolutely. And it leads to, of course, to the other point, women in the church today. One, what I tried to say, to bring back Mary is to bring back the woman and women and acknowledge more their place and role. So there is a contribution. But yes, we already have so many saints, it's true. But a new time, a new phase in the life of the church needs new saints. So I believe a Marian Saint Lacola would answer different questions of the church today. Thank you, Alois. I just want to give a perspective of Jan Marie Chavon in a sense that she, um, she thought Colin was everything 
and right up until her deathbed, she knew that he had the inspiration of what to be Maris was all about. And I think she could put behind her the whole problems because even when she was dying, he still didn't come, he, he still wasn't around for her. But she wrote at, that, at her deathbed, make sure Colin writes the rule. And I think that's really important because she believed so much in him and what he was bringing to the church at the time and that we were to follow that. So I think it's important to know that she believed in him and believed in the vision that he had. And we live by that today and I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh we tend to look back from 21st century into the 19th century. So if you go back as you did to what they themselves thought about it, but it still needs a good study. Je crois que la beatification de Colin nous aiderait à mieux connaître les autres fondateurs maristes. Parce qu'à l'heure actuelle, nous sommes encore trop dans une logique de congrégation et la béatification de Colin nous aiderait à revenir à une vision globale de la société de Marie. Pour ma part, je trouve que si on étudie Champagnat, on ne le comprend bien que si l'on connaît les autres fondateurs. Parce que, par exemple, Colin euh, est plutôt euh, explicite et en plus il a eu un mémorialiste qui s'appelait le Père Maillet qui nous a dit beaucoup de choses sur lui. Et il me semble que Champagnat euh, a suggéré des choses mais ne les a pas vraiment dites et... Ils sont finalement plus proches l'un de l'autre que nous ne croyons. Quant à la relation avec Jeanne-Marie Chaouin, j'ai beaucoup apprécié ce qui vient d'être dit. Ça me paraît tout à fait exact. Et je trouve ça très intéressant. Merci bien. Yes, it's another thing. At the time, it was much more common project. Today, we come from separate congregations looking back, and thank you, yes, that's a good point. Obrigado pela apresentação. Muito se fala sobre o papel de Maria no começo da igreja, na teologia e nos escritos do Padre Colen. A minha pergunta, Padre, é qual a visão cristológica que o Padre Colém aporta para a Sociedade de Maria e para a Igreja nos dias de hoje. Porque me parece que o Padre Colém fala de Maria no começo da Igreja e no final dos tempos também, mas gostaria de ouvir o Senhor qual é a contribuição a partir de Cristo que o Padre Colém tem para a Sociedade de Maria, a figura de Cristo uh, a partir dos escritos do Padre Colém. Thank you. You raise it to the theological level, <laughs> which is always a spiritual level, very much in line with our founders. Now, Champagne, Christocentric. Cola, yes and no. Cola was more focused on God, calling humble people like Mary as instruments of his mercy and grace. Cola Christocentric when it comes to education and foreign missions. Make Christians out of the students and pagans, sorry. But basically, Cola, the place of Mary is because Cola always thought his thinking was not, well, God is at work, no need to discuss. His thinking was, who responds, who listens, who responds, who allows God to work through him or her. 
So the focus on Mary is because Kola's thinking is always focusing on let us respond, let us listen, let us be like Mary, instruments of God's mercy. And therefore his language is very Mary. Okay? I, I realize there are a number of, of people eager to ask questions, but the time is, is running out. Otherwise we'll be staying with us for a few days. So you have ample opportunity to speak to him privately. Um, and so on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to present Aloy with this little gift. Thank you very much.